How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Friends, good evening for another exciting meeting here in New York City at the Manhattan Center on this balmy, somewhat wet evening. We're so glad that wherever you are, whether it's sunny or whether it's raining, we're glad that you've chosen to be with us tonight for this vitally important topic entitled The Cleansing Temple. The wonderful topics that are being presented tonight and tomorrow night are dual. They stick together. So please make plans to be with us not only tonight, but also tomorrow night. And we have an exciting topic coming up on Friday evening, the tale of two women. What does the Bible say in prophecy about those two women? Before we go any further, I'd like to invite you tonight to bow your heads with me as we invite God's presence to be with us. Gracious Father in heaven, what a joy it is to know that you have kept us another evening, another day. You have given us strength for our bodies, strength for our hearts, you have given us minds with which to think and eyes with which to read the Word of God. We invite your Spirit to be in our presence, to lead us, to strengthen us, to help our understanding to expand, but more than all of those things, Lord, to draw closer to Thee in love for You. We thank You for Pastor Doug, who has been making the Bible clear to us. We pray that tonight will not be an exception as we gather together wherever we are. We pray that we will be united around the world in one goal, and that is to get ready for your soon return. So thank you for this opportunity. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Friends, join me here in Manhattan and also around the world as we welcome our speaker again this evening, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you, John. Evening. Welcome to the Millennium of Prophecy. I want to welcome our friends who are studying the Word of God with us around North America, around the world. The reports that are coming in are very exciting. We have a blustery day here in New York City. I've been walking to and from the uh, hall, and uh, the wind out there will turn your umbrella inside out if you're not careful. Well, I wonder how much time we've got left for questions. I'm going to invite Mrs. Batchelor out, and we'll cover as many as we possibly can. I'm coming. Okay. It's a long way. You'd be surprised from way back there in the, the waiting room. Right. Okay. How trustworthy is the King James Version of the Bible? And what about other versions? Okay. Well, there are many, many translations. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there are more translations in English than any other language. Keep something in mind. The King James Translation is, I believe, one of the best, if not the best. One reason there are many translations is because the King James Version is public domain, which means it cannot be copyrighted. And these publishers that publish Bibles, if they're going to own their version, they need to come up with a new one. I'm just being honest with you, friends. And so a lot of publishers are motivated to continually come up with their own translation. Some of them are very good. Some of them are not as good. Uh, King James and New King James are a couple of my favorites because they are principally from what we call the Textus Receptus, the received text. There are three primary manuscripts that Bibles come from. The Vaticanus, it was a manuscript found in the Vatican and there are some suspicious deletions and additions and changes there. The Sinaiticus, which was found, I think, in a garbage can in St. Catherine's Monastery on top of Mount Sinai which it was also, some people felt it was corrupt or not as accurate, and then the Textus Receptus. And there's other parchments and parcels and pieces of uh, uh, manuscripts, but my favorite versions are the ones that come from uh, the Textus Receptus, which the King James did. Many other versions in other languages also were used, are uh, incorporated, the Textus Receptus. Okay, and for our last question. <laughs> 
Sorry, we just... <laughs> Must obey the clock. There we go. What color skin did Jesus have? And why do we show our media presentations with primarily a Eurocentric orientation of Jesus when we don't really know what color Jesus or any of the Bible characters were? We've had a couple of questions that came in on that, and I asked Karen to include that because I've been wanting all along to say, do not take the slides and the paintings and the pictures that I show too seriously because what I'm doing is drawing upon the hundreds of artists and their conceptions. Obviously, I have no photographs of Jesus. I don't have any photographs of these Bible characters. You have seen paintings of the resurrection where folks are coming out of the grave in tuxedos. I don't think it's going to be that way. And so please don't take some of these illustrations and paintings too seriously. If you've got more diversity and, and uh, stuff that I can incorporate, I'm doing my best. Uh, we all know that Christ was not what we would call a black or white. He, he was Semitic. And so... Um, uh, Take all of the illustrations with a grain of salt. Uh, frankly, can I just share a little bit about where I'm coming from? I grew up in New York City. I went to public school here. Uh, I was raised by a mother who taught me that people are all people. And I really appreciated that. And uh, I believe that God's children are from every stripe and type of humanity. When I look out there right now, I don't see anyone black. I don't see anyone white. We are all varying shades of brown. My, uh, I lived on the Navajo Reservation. I've never seen a red Navajo Indian yet. I've met a lot of Orientals. I've never met a yellow one. I think sometimes we accentuate racial problems by trying to make these stark, radical color differences. We're all God's children. The Bible says God has made of one blood all nations, okay? Amen. We have an amazing fact for you. On the big island of Hawaii is a massive temple... It's about 1,000 feet long by 700 feet wide with walls that are 20 feet high and 20 feet thick. I've been there. It's really an incredible sight to see. It dates back to ancient times in Hawaii before it was settled by the tourists. And in their Hawaiian law, they had a number of taboo um, uh, behaviors that were not permitted. And if you broke one of these sacred laws, it was called kapu. And if you committed kapu, you were kaput. The death penalty was the uh, result of that. Some of the kapu were, you were not supposed to have, not supposed to step on the shadow of the high priest. And uh, if you caught the wrong fish, the wrong time of year, kapu, death penalty. <laughs> Women were not supposed to ever eat bananas. That was kapu. And you ladies are like this. Men were not supposed to let women cook for them. <laughs> Kapu. If you did that, that's right. But there was, there was a little loophole. There was a way to survive. If they could get to this sacred temple called the Puhuahonua, place of refuge, a city of refuge, get past the armed guards and go inside, they could go through a cleansing, a purification ceremony where they would be forgiven and could be once again introduced into society. This temple, this sacred ground, was a place where they could be absolved and forgiven. Likewise, the Bible tells us that Christ, his body, is a temple. Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will make one without hands. And that same temple we can come to. We can come to Christ, and as a result, we can be forgiven. Now that goes well into our study for tonight, dealing with the heavenly model. Let's take a look at our historical briefly. Now, when Moses first led the children of Israel across the Red Sea into the wilderness area, instead of heading north directly to the Promised Land, he went south down to Mount Sinai. Not only was he supposed to receive the Ten Commandments there, but he was also up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights getting other additional instruction. You see, these people had been slaves for several generations, and they needed some guidance in how to organize as a nation. They had no laws, no civil laws. But even more than that, while up on the mountain, the Lord did something he had never done before or has never done since. He gave some very intricate instructions unto Moses on how they were to build and construct a sacred temple, a tabernacle, that was to be a teaching instrument for them that was to demonstrate how God saves. This portable place of worship 
was to be a microcosm, an illustration of the whole plan of salvation. Well, let's get right into our question because we have a lot of material to cover this evening. And I invite you, how many of you have done your lessons? I like to encourage you to concentrate and to follow along. What are we supposed to do when we get to the answers? Call them out with me. Thank you very much. Number one, what did God ask Moses to build and why? The Bible says, he said in Exodus 25, 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. This sanctuary was to be a place where God was to meet with them. Now, when Solomon dedicated the temple that was later built in the Promised Land, he in his prayer said, the heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. So did God need a place to be protected from the elements? He said, I'm out here in the cold, I'm homeless, make a sanctuary for me. Is that what the Lord was after? Obviously not. He wanted to teach them something about himself through this. Not only were they given instructions about the sanctuary and all the different articles and elements they were to build, we'll look at those in just a minute, but they were given instructions about Aaron and his sons, the clothing they were to wear, the breastplate. Matter of fact, right down to the very underwear they wore, God had specified what the materials were to be. There was a breastplate that the high priest used to wear, 12 stones on the breastplate. Each one of those stones had one of the names of the children of Israel in it. Incidentally, the 12 stones that were on the heart of the high priest, just as Jesus bears us on his heart and he's our high priest, those same 12 stones were the foundation stones you find in Revelation for the New Jerusalem. And you know, the Bible says that in the foundation of the city were the names of the 12 tribes. And so here you've got the high priest above his head. He had a gold placard that said, Holiness to the Lord. You can remember where Peter tells us, Be holy, for I am holy. And the Bible tells us we are a nation of priests as well. And so there was so much that was to be learned from this sanctuary that uh, it deserves special attention. You'll find out in just a moment why it's part of a prophecy study. Question number two. What did God expect his people to learn from the sanctuary and its services? Say the answer with me. Psalm 77, verse 13. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. The way of God, the way that he saves us, is in that sanctuary. He demonstrates the process of salvation in that sanctuary. You notice when you read Revelation chapter 1 and Jesus first appears, he is wearing the garments, glorified though they be, of a high priest. The Bible says Christ appears among the seven candlesticks. That was one of the rooms in the sanctuary on earth. This earthly sanctuary was a little miniature of the heavenly sanctuary. How many of you remember reading about uh, in the book of Isaiah, the conversion experience of Isaiah that you find in chapter 6? It says that he saw the Lord in his temple, on his throne. That vision, Ezekiel's vision, many of the visions that you find, Zechariah, in the Old Testament, the prophecies were given in the context of this heavenly temple, this dwelling place of God where the altar of God was, and we'll explain, or the throne of God was in particular. Keep in mind, what you see here on earth, it was also demonstrating the process of salvation. We have been separated from God by sin. They used to sacrifice lambs in the sanctuary. Jesus is our lamb. The Bible tells us he is our priest. And so for us to understand the whole science of salvation, the sanctuary really gives us a three-dimensional teaching lesson. You know, before we built the stage in preparation for the uh, Millennium of Prophecy program, we drew up some plans and made some miniature uh, images and, and models so that we can get an idea of what the real thing would be. And it's often true that before architects build a massive building project, what do they do? They go to these model builders and they build miniature models so that you can get the concept and you can learn and, and find out and tweak things from the model to better understand the reality when it's finally constructed. Well, God wanted us to understand something about the reality of salvation when it came through an edifice. And you'll be surprised as we proceed how much we can learn from this structure called the sanctuary. Question number three, where did Moses obtain the blueprints for this sanctuary? Exodus 25, verse 40. And it says, and look that thou make them after their 
pattern which was shown thee on the mount. Now, did Moses dream these things up on his own? I mean, he was a shepherd for 40 years in the wilderness. The dimensions of this sanctuary in its design and its arrangement is just incredible in its proportions. The same way that God gave the instructions and dimensions to Noah for the ark, all to scale, God gave Moses these plans. But keep something in mind. Anything we build on earth to better understand what's going on in heaven is flawed. The earthly sanctuary was a small miniature of a very real dwelling place that God has in heaven. Let me give you an example. In the real dwelling place of God in heaven, he is flanked by two living angels. The earthly sanctuary, they're made of gold. The living temple of God in heaven, he has 10,000 times 10,000 angels that surround him, these countless ministering spirits. On the earthly sanctuary, to picture that, they had engraved angels in the golden wallpaper. So whatever you saw on earth was a feeble model of what's really going on in heaven. You understand? So God doesn't have a, a cumbersome box up there in heaven that he lives in. But this portable mobile temple was to help them understand the very real one that God has in, the, in heaven. Question number four. Let's quickly look at the furniture that was in the courtyard of the sanctuary. What furniture was in the courtyard? There you have the question. Say the answer with me. Exodus 29, 18. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. Answer B. There was an altar out there first. The second thing was, thou shalt make a, a laver of brass, and thou shalt put water therein. Now, before I go any farther, I want to illustrate something. There were three aspects to the sanctuary, three parts. There was what they called the courtyard, there was the holy place, and the most holy place. In Christianity, we use three big words to describe the science of salvation. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Justification means you come just like you are. That's the altar. That's the lamb. When the children of Israel sacrificed the lamb in Egypt, they came just like they were. They were slaves. Moses did not come to them and say, tell you what, you keep the Ten Commandments and we'll get you out of Egypt. Did he? They were saved just based on the grace of God. Am I right? And that's how the Lord looks. Then they went through the laver, the Red Sea, baptism, water, cleansing, basin. See, that's the next step in the process of salvation. Now, we've talked about what's in the courtyard. We've got a little video animation I'm going to walk you through here that helps illustrate what you're going to see when we get inside the tabernacle. On the inside of the tabernacle, you have the area of sanctification first in what you would call the holy place, and then after that you've got glorification in the holy of holies, or sometimes called the holiest of all. And so we're going to roll this little animation out because, you know, we spent all this time talking to you about the importance of visualizing what's going to happen in the temple. We thought it would be beneficial if you could visualize it. So here we go. We're going now into the holy place. You're very privileged. Only the priest could do that. Candlestick was there on the right, uh, left. Your table of shoe bread was on the right. Altar of incense with its little censer was at the front of the veil. Then in the holy of holies, you've got the Ark of the Covenant, not to be confused with Noah's Ark. The two angels on top, what we call the mercy seat, the Shekinah glory, or the presence of God, was between them. Inside the ark, under the mercy seat, the foundation of his government, you've got the Ten Commandments, two tables of stone, and the Bible says written on both sides. Did you know that? You know why? Because God made a covenant, and there are two copies, one for him, one for us, and we keep them in the same safety deposit box. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. So there you've got a little picture of what was going on inside of the tabernacle. Now let's review it again. We memorize a lot more by hearing and by saying the answers, okay? Question number five. What three items of furniture are in the holy place? Let's review this now. Answer A, and upon the table of showbread, or it sounds like shoe bread, it's showbread. It means it was bread for the presence of God. They shall spread a cloth of blue, and the continual bread shall be therein. Answer B, when thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. 
So there was the lampstand, the candlestick was the other article that was in there. Then answer C, and thou shalt make in an altar to burn incense upon, of shittim wood thou shalt make it. All of these things were made of gold, symbolizing the purity of uh, each one of these different aspects. Now, I'm moving along quickly now because I want you to get the big picture, and then I'm going to stop for a while, and I'm going to try and teach you, I won't be preaching as much as teaching, the many different symbols that can be seen in the sanctuary. Number six, what special article was in the most holy place? Answer, Exodus 26, verse 34, and thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. So this ark, you've heard about the lost ark. We'll talk about that. It was in the most holy place. Question number seven, what was inside the ark? Exodus 25, 21, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. Deuteronomy 10, verse 4 and 5, and he, God, wrote upon the tables according to the first writing the Ten Commandments. Now that's what the testimony was. The Ten Commandments, and I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark which I had made and there they be as the Lord commanded me. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute, friends. When I think of the Holy Land, what, do you, what uh, piece of geography do you think of? If I say the Holy Land. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, well, Jerusalem is the city, but you think about Israel, right? The Holy Land. Now, if I say the Holy City, there's a song called the Holy City. What do they sing about? Jerusalem. Now, in the holy city, they've got the holy mount. Sometimes it's called Mount Zion. Sometimes it's called Mount Moriah. Now, on the holy mount, they had the holy temple, right? Stay with me, friends. Talking about the holiest spot on the planet. If you could put your finger down and say, where is the holiest place in the planet? You got the holy land, and then you got the holy city, and then you got the holy mount, and then you got the holy temple on the holy mount, and on the holy temple, you've got the holy place. You go through the holy place, and you get to the holiest of the holies. Do we stop there? What was in the holiest of holies that made it so holy? The Ark of the Covenant, a golden box. And you know, there have been a lot of people who've wondered, where is the Ark now? Matter of fact, we had a question tonight we did not get to. And it dealt with, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, actually, the question is said, where is the Ark? Now, if they're talking about Noah's Ark, it's on Mount Ararat, according to the Bible said. If they're wondering about the Ark of the Covenant, or maybe they're talking about a little Ark that Moses was put in as a baby. <laughs> There's three Arks in the Bible. The Ark of the Testament, or the Ark of the Covenant, this golden box, and people are wishing they could find it, it suddenly disappeared just before Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the temple. See, Jeremiah told King Zedekiah the temple was going to be destroyed and burnt. And a lot of Bible scholars believe that evidently Jeremiah and some of the priests took that ark and they hid it somewhere in a cave nearby Jerusalem because God knew what was going to happen. One reason we know that is when they came back to Jerusalem, the king of Persia gave them all the holy vessels and implements of the temple, but the ark of the covenant was never heard about again. It somehow vanished before the temple was destroyed. And so we believe it's still hidden somewhere, probably not too far from Jerusalem, because it was heavy. It required 12 men to carry it, and you can't carry something that glorious that far in the daytime. I think they secreted it out of the city at night and hid it maybe in a tomb and sealed it, but it's still hidden somewhere in the Promised Land. And people think one of the greatest archaeological finds would be either Noah's Ark, co concrete, tangible evidence of Noah's Ark, or the Ark of the Covenant. People think, oh, if we could find that golden box. But friends, everybody misses the point. The important thing about the Holy of Holies was not the golden box. That was the packaging. That was the container. The important thing was the rocks in the box. Now think about this, friends. Don't miss my point. The Holy Land, Israel. Holy City, Jerusalem. Holy Mountain, Mount Zion, Mount Moriah. Holy Temple, the Holy Place. And in the holy place, you've got the holy of holies. And in there, you've got the holy ark of the covenant. And it's all built around a couple of rocks. What was so important about those rocks? God, for the first time in the history of the world, he wrote his will with, with his own hand. The rest of the Bible is written by man. 
and people think, oh, if we can find the Ark of the Covenant, they're not interested in the rocks in the box because you have what's on the rocks in your Bible. People think if I can find the golden box, they get excited. They don't want the rocks in the box, right? You know, Moses said, what nation is honored like this nation? The word is not far away from you that you should say who is going to ascend into heaven and bring it down that we can know, or who's going to go fishing in the ocean and fish it up that we can know, but it's even in your mouth. It's right near you. You and I know what's in that box. It's in our Bibles. It's the Ten Commandments, right? Amen. And so we ought to think about and appreciate the great holy treasure that God's given us in the Bible. Why do you think it's called Santa Biblia? Holy Bible. It's a holy book. And... I'm saying that to help us maintain our perception of how sacred the Ten Commandments is to God because we're still living in a Christian world where people are saying, we're not under the law, the Ten Commandments have been abolished, we just are sort of led by this nebulous spirit that's going to guide us now. No, friends, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Word of God and the law of God has not changed, and the Lord still expects us to keep it. Amen? All right, where did I leave off there? Question number eight. Question number eight. Why did the animals need to be sacrificed in the Old Testament sanctuary services? Hebrews 9, 22. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness. The life is in the blood, the Bible says. I remember one time something that made a very graphic impression on me I'll never forget. I was driving in Maine one cold winter day. There was snow all over the ground. We were following a, a dump truck or something some friends and I, and this beautiful husky-like dog ran out to bark at the tires, you know how dogs do that, of this loud dump truck as it went by, and the dog did not calculate that its feet were going to slip as it ran out because of the ice on the road. It slid under the car, and we all went, oh no, because the dog got hit and rolled out from underneath this dump truck. Well, the, the truck driver just went off, and those of us in our car, we stopped, and the poor animal was still alive in the road, but it was bleeding badly. And the crimson red blood was running out on the white snow, and the contrast, and the steam was coming out of the blood. It, it left a very vivid impression on me, and the poor dog was struggling, and we tried to soothe it, but we watched as the blood ran out. There was nothing we could do. It was mortally wounded. It became quieter and stiller until it died. And we saw very vividly that day how the life is in the blood. Well, Jesus gave his life. He gave his blood to cover our sins. Amen. Second part of that answer, it says in uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the what? Remission. For the remission. What's remission mean? For the forgiveness of sins. You've heard me say before the first miracle that Jesus did was he turned water into Pure grape juice, a symbol of his pure blood. And for people who think that at the communion service, Jesus had them drinking alcohol, that's a terrible mistake. The Bible tells us the bread was to be unleavened, and likewise the grape juice was to be unfermented. You do not find the word grape juice in the Bible. It's always called wine. Sometimes it was fermented. Sometimes it was pure grape juice, as it says in Isaiah, as the new wine is in the cluster. That's grape juice. It's not fermented yet. The word wine comes from the word vine. It means the juice of the vine. The first thing Jesus did, he turned water into wine. The last thing he did, he tasted the bitter wine while he was on the cross, the sour wine, the Bible says. That's a symbol of our sin. He took our sins. He gave us his blood, his life, his vitality. Did you know grape juice has antibiotic properties to it? That's right. That's part of the reason that Paul said to Timothy, drink a little wine, a grape juice, for your often infirmities and your stomach ailments. Question number nine. When animals were sacrificed for sin, what happened to the sin? It says in Leviticus 1, verse 4 and 5, And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make an atonement for him, and he shall kill the bullock before the Lord. You know, back in the Bible time, you've got to keep in mind, they were largely shepherds. They were a nomadic people. When they went through the wilderness, they had their flocks and their herds. When Jacob brought his family into Egypt, he said, we are shepherds by trade. Principally, that's what the children of Israel were. David was a shepherd that God chose, and Joseph was a shepherd, and Moses was a shepherd, and, and God blessed shepherds all through the Bible. 
they were often very close to their flocks. Now, you might not understand how could they be so tender and so close with these animals that they would sacrifice. It was supposed to hurt them. It was supposed to hurt. David laid his life on the line to save a sheep from a lion and again from a bear. And when Nathan the prophet came to David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he told this poignant story about a man who had one lamb that lived in the house with the family. I used to have goats, and the goats used to come in the house. We milked them there, and they were our friends. I remember when a bear came and took one of our goats. And uh, it was night, and I could hear the poor thing howling as uh, a bear picked up an 80-pound goat and ran uphill with it. My 22 was out in the truck, and uh, I thought about going out in the dark and getting my 22 and chasing after the bear. I thought about David and what he did, but then I remembered that David did it for a lamb, not a goat. We know how the Bible speaks about goats, right? And you don't go after a bear with a 22. Are you aware of that? That just, they think they're being stung by bees. It just makes them mad. But uh, they love their animals in Bible times. And when they used to have to take these creatures that they cared for and, and nurtured and reared and lay their hands on it, when they sinned and confessed their sins, it grieved them and it caused them pain. And then to have to take the life. Do you know when you lay a lamb on its back, the Bible says, as sheep before their shears are dumb, so he opened not his mouth. When you lay a lamb on its back, because of the way they breathe, they become very docile and they do not struggle. And Christ, as a lamb for its shears, he put up no resistance. And to put your hands on the head of one of these innocent little victims and confess your sins and then kill it and watch the life run out, and you know that it's taking what you deserve. Would it be hard for you to sin if you knew every time you sinned you had to kill a lamb? How much more difficult should it be for us when we consider that our sins cost the life of God's beloved son? One time I wanted to do a three-dimensional illustration in a church I pastored when talking about the Lord's Supper. You know, the Lord's Supper was a Passover service. He said, I've longed to eat this Passover with you. I brought a real lamb into the church. And, uh, you know, the folks knew I was a little bit different. And so I brought it in, and we tied it up, and I got my knife, and I was illustrating it, and I took the knife, and I said, then they cut the throat, and I went up like this, and the whole church was, ah, don't do it, stop. And I didn't, of course. I did bring the knife down just to get a reaction, but I didn't do, do anything to the lamb. But you know what? Folks were aghast that I would do that to a little lamb. And I said, how often have we come to church failing to recognize that we crucify the Son of God afresh with our sins? And we're indifferent. We don't realize. We say Jesus died for the sin of the whole world, and we forget he died for my sins personally. My sins grieve him, see. We sometimes lose the personal aspect. Yes, he did die for the sins of the whole world, but he suffered individually for you as well. Let's do question number 10. When a sacrificial animal was offered for the entire congregation, what happened to the sin? Leviticus 4, 17, the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. Now, not only did they bring incense and put it on the altar of incense, that was a symbol of prayer, but sometimes they'd bring their blood and sprinkle the blood before the veil on uh, their daily sacrifices. Now, on a daily basis, they used to bring the blood and come into the holy place. But they didn't go into the holy of holies except once a year. And we will get into that in just a minute. Number 11. What two sanctuary symbols does Jesus fulfill for us? Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Christ is our Passover. He is sacrificed for us. Now, we've been getting some lessons or some letters and emails from some of our friends who are watching around the country. And they said, Doug, if you're going to keep the Sabbath, they shouldn't you be keeping the other ceremonial feasts? No. Is there a difference between the seventh day Sabbath and the other annual Sabbath days that the Jews would celebrate? Great deal of difference. Matter of fact, the only thing you've got in common is they were also holy days or days of rest, Sabbath. That's what the word Sabbath means. Everything else was different. The Sabbath of the Ten Commandments came before sin. It's part of God's perfect plan. We will keep it in the new earth, Isaiah chapter 66, right? The Sabbath of the ceremonial laws did not come until the Exodus experience. The Sabbath of the Ten Commandments were written by God, his own finger. 
The ceremonial Sabbaths were written by Moses. The Sabbath of the Ten Commandments was written in stone. The ceremonial Sabbaths were written on paper. The Ten Commandments spoken by God's voice. The ceremonial Sabbaths were spoken by Moses. The Ten Commandments were put inside the ark. The ceremonial laws and festivals were outside the ark. They were nailed to the cross. The Bible tells us Christ is our Passover. Now, after the architect gets done with his model of the building he's going to build, he eventually gets around to the actual building, right? When he builds the real building, he does not try to squeeze his body into the model. And for us now to go back to the ceremonial laws after all that they pointed to, the substances come, would be anti-productive. What would you think of me now if I started killing lambs and you said, Doug, why are you doing that? I said, so I can have my sins covered by the blood of the lamb. You'd say, you've missed something, Doug. The lamb of God came now. Why do you think when Jesus died on the cross that the veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom? It was signifying that all the ceremonial laws have been deactivated. Now the substance is here. The reality is here. We don't need to go backwards to the models and the symbols now. We've got the reality of Christ. Amen. And so we can still learn from these feasts. We can benefit from the lessons they teach. But now, do we still keep Passover? Yeah, we do. Christ brought it into the future by saying, now the Passover, you don't kill a lamb. I'm the lamb. The grape juice is my blood. The bread is my body. And whenever we have a communion service as Christians, it is a memorial of the exodus when that angel of judgment passed over because of the blood of the lamb, except now Jesus is our lamb. We don't need lamb's blood, right? So we're now living in the reality of those things. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. We have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, at this point, I would like to look at an illustration. You have this in your lesson. I didn't put it as soon as you normally have it, but you'll see in your lesson you've got a little outline of the sanctuary. We've got this up on the screen here for you to look at. I want you to notice that the sanctuary teaches us so many things about God that um, help us understand the plan of salvation. First of all, how many doors were there? One door. Christ said, I am the door in the Gospel of John, right? Think about all the I am's that Jesus used in his teaching. He said, I am the door. He is the bread. He is the light. Christ is using the emblems that were in the sanctuary to tell us that he is those things. He is um, the fullness of all that they represented. One way in. What was the first thing you saw when you went in? You saw the altar. The first step in salvation is the sacrifice. Incidentally, you'll see down on my illustration, there's a little sacrifice, sacrifice steak. Uh, this is not in the Bible, but in Jewish tradition, they evidently had a little steak with a cross driven in the ground near the altar where they would actually cut the throat of the little lamb. They'd tie it up. You remember when Jesus went into the temple when they were making merchandise? And it says he took the cords. They used these cords for tying the lambs before they were sacrificed. And so there was a little stake there with a cross on it. So the rope wouldn't slip off the top. First thing you saw was an altar and a little stake. Okay? What is our first step in salvation? Sacrifice. First you begin a journey. Notice what's happening. As you go through the door, you're going in a straight line. The Holy of Holies represents the presence of God, glorification. The first step is on your way to God. We're separated from God. We begin a journey. The altar, the sacrifice, the children of Israel, before they began a journey to the promised land, before they took the first step out of Egypt, what they have to do? Kill the Passover lamb. Before you begin a journey to heaven, you've got to accept the lamb. You can't become a Christian until you accept the lamb. Step number one. You notice that... God doesn't say, obey my law, and then I'll forgive you. First, you come just like you are, and you accept the lamb. So they would go to the altar. Then after the sacrifice was the laver. What was in the laver? Water. After the children of Israel sacrificed the lamb in Egypt, they began a transition. They crossed through the Red Sea. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says they were baptized in the sea. We then are baptized, and immediately after baptism, you enter into the next phase because baptism is the transition. It's the threshold from justification into glorification. It's the way you join the church. You notice you don't get into the holy place until you go through the water. People say, I'd like to get baptized, but I don't want to be part of a church. Well, that's like washing in the labor and never entering the holy place. 
That's like a baby being born and not being placed in a family. And so that just doesn't make any sense. That's like a guy saying to a girl, I'd like to get married, but we don't need to live together, do we? You're going to wonder if he's got another wife somewhere else. And so then you enter a new phase. Now you go into sanctification. That's when you enter the holy place, and there were three things in there. There was the light, there was the bread, and there was the incense. Notice, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. When the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, when they went by the labor and they entered the wilderness, did God give them bread from heaven, miracle bread? See? Jesus said that we need to get that bread of life every day. We need to gather it. The priests would replace the bread so it was never stale. On a daily basis, they had fresh bread. God rained down the bread on a daily basis in the wilderness except the Sabbath. They got bread six days a week, but on the Sabbath, they were supposed to get twice as much on the preparation day to last them. I study twice as hard on Friday, usually because I'm preaching the next day too. I need the extra bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread. He said, I'm the light. And Christ is our high priest. We pray in his name. That's what the incense was. You see, the priest would take this incense and sprinkle it on the altar of incense, and it would waft over the curtain into the presence of God, just as Christ makes atonement. We pray in his name. He presents our prayers for us. We come boldly before the throne, Hebrews tells us, by virtue of Christ. Amen? Not only is Jesus the light, but he said, you're the light. Not only is Jesus our high priest, but the Bible says in Peter, you are a nation of priests. What was the priest's job? To make atonement. You know what atonement means? At one meant. It means to bring us back to God. We've been separated. This whole thing is a journey back to God. Not only did Jesus say, I am the bread, but when the people got hungry, Jesus gave bread to the disciples and apostles, and he said, you give them something to eat. We are to receive the bread from Christ after he blesses it, and then we are to distribute it, see? Not only is Christ the light of the world, you're the light of the world. You and I are priests. And so the sanctuary not only teaches us about Jesus, it tells us what our responsibility is, because Christ said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Amen. Jesus' body was a temple. Isn't that right? Amen. He said, destroy this temple made with hands and I'll raise it up. And then later at his trial... The only honest testimony that came out is, at his trial was this. He said, destroy this temple made with hands and I will make one without hands. He did say that. He was talking about his body. And Christ's body, when he rose up, the church rose up. The church is called the body of Christ. Now, not only is Jesus' body the temple, you, Paul says, are the temple of God, not only individually, but collectively. Then you go into the Holy of Holies, and that's glorification. That's the presence of God. We are separated right now, but Christ removed the veil, so someday we can live in the presence of God. You see, friends, right now we're looking through a glass darkly, but someday we're going to see face to face. And so we are moving towards God. Not only does the sanctuary tell us about the plan of salvation, all of life is made up of cells. Your body individually is the temple of God. A cell has three parts. There are three parts here. You've got the courtyard, the holy place, the most holy place. An egg is an example of a cell. It's got the shell, it's got the white, it's got the yolk. A cell has got the membrane, it's got the plasma, it's got the nucleus. We've got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the angels go holy, holy, holy. And the sanctuary is, is just a little picture of the life. Your body is like a temple. You have an altar in your body, you are consuming energy, you're burning, there's a fire that is consuming energy all the time. You're constantly consuming energy as your heart beats and as your circulation goes. Humans do not hibernate. You've got a cleansing system, the laver. You've got a circulatory system that is feeding and cleansing your body continually. Am I right? Amen. Then you go into the holy place. Jesus said the light of the body is the eye. Okay? Was there food stored in the temple? Do our bodies store food? Some of us don't want to admit it. Some of us store more than others, but we have storage as well. Am, am I right? And then there's incense, the spirit of man. Now, if the temple represents a human body, what would the holy of holies be? What part of your body would be the holy of holies? Right here. This is the holy of holies. This is the sacred spot. And so this is a microcosm. It's a little miniature picture of the whole plan of salvation. And we can learn so much about Jesus from that. Let's go on here to question number 12. 
What six wonderful promises does the Bible give us about the righteousness offered to us by Jesus? Now, we're going to move through some of these quickly. Answer A, he will cover our past sins and countless, count us guiltless. You know, it's a wonderful thing to be clean, friends. You know, sometimes, just like you, I do things I'm ashamed of, and I need to get on my knees and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. And I believe that he forgives me. You know why I believe it? It's hard for me to comprehend that God would go through everything he went to to provide forgiveness for the whole world and not forgive me when I ask him. Amen. He wants me to believe. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. You know how Abraham demonstrated his belief? He not only said, I believe, he took his son up on the mountain and was willing to lay down his son to obey. He demonstrated his belief because the Bible tells us even though Isaac was the son of promise, Abraham believed that God was able to raise him from the dead if necessary. He said, I'm going to obey God and I'm going to trust that he's still going to be a father of multitudes. So he obeyed and God counts us guiltless. He forgives us. Answer B, Jesus promises to restore us to God's image. Man was originally created in the image of God. That image has been virtually erased by sin. Some of you remember the story you find it in Luke chapter 8. You can find it in Mark chapter 5 about this demoniac. This man that was possessed with legions of demons. He ran around naked up in the mountains like Pastor Doug used to do. And a long hair and a beard. <laughs> and the Bible says he had chains and cut himself with stones. And I think he was a monster. Foaming at the mouth, glaring eyes. Just mad, insane, shrieking, crying. That man was filled with demons. Those that follow the devil take on the image of the devil. Those that follow Christ take on the image of Christ. You become like the God you worship. That's something to consider. Some people worship animals. You become like what you worship. Then answer C. Jesus gives us the desire and the power to do God's will. You know, the wonderful thing is he changes our desires. When I became a Christian... I thought, well, Christians don't have any fun. I'm going to do it because I know it's true, but this is not going to be fun. And I was longing for the things of the world. But you know something? The things I once loved, I hate. And the things I once hated, I now love. And I remember when I first started going to church and I heard the Christians singing the hymns, I was listening to the music of the world. And I thought, oh, man, this is torture. <laughs> All the saints were making a joyful noise. And you know what I'd do? I'd look at the hymn at the beginning of the service, and if it had more than three verses, I went to the bathroom because it was painful for me to sit there. And I, this one church I was going to, they could not even sing on key. It was slow and off key. And I remember one day slowly something was changing in my heart. And I came out one day, and I looked at the opening hymn to see how many verses, and it had a lot of verses, and it was that song, I Will Sing of Jesus' Love. And I thought, I'll look at the words. I will sing of Jesus' love, sing of him who first loved me, for he left his throne above and died on Calvary. I will sing, sing of Jesus' love. You know what? I was listening to these old saints sing out of key, and I started crying. I started thinking for once about the words, where before in the world all I thought about was the beat of the music. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and now I was thinking about the message instead of the music. And I changed, and now that which I once loved, I loathe, and now which I once dreaded, I love. God changed me. He'll change your desires. Now do I get to do D? Yes, D. Jesus will help us to do only the things that please God. You know, when you invite the Lord into your heart, he then changes your desires, and he helps you be willing to do his will, as we sing in our theme song. You know, the Bible tells us without Christ, I can't do anything. But through Christ, I can do all things. And if Christ is in us, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. Answer E, he removes our death sentence by giving us credit for his sinless life and atoning death. You know, the wonderful story of the Good Samaritan, that Good Samaritan represented Christ. The Jew who fell among thieves represents the human race. The Good Samaritan, when he found this man, the man was afraid of him because he was a Samaritan, a, an enemy. But the Samaritan said, look, I'm going to make a trade with you. He took his clothes and he tore them up and he bandaged his wounds. 
He used his oil and his wine. He put him on his beast. He took him to the inn. He dug into his pocket, and he paid his rent at the hotel so the man might be healed. He traded places with him. He said, you ride, I'll walk. I'm going to give you my food. I'm going to give you my oil, my wine. That's what Christ did. He made an exchange with us. He gives us his strength in place of our weakness. He gives us his goodness, and he takes our badness. This is the gospel. And it, when you believe it, it really happens. But you believe it first, then the reality takes place. Answer F. Jesus assumes responsibility for helping to keep us faithful until he returns. You know, the Bible says that God is not a quitter. He will finish what he started. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Now, when I look at Christ, I get discouraged from time to time because he's my example and I have a long way to go. But when I look at how far he's brought me, I've got faith he will finish in my life what he started because God is the author and finisher. He which has begun a good work in you will perform it if you keep on following. When I look at how far he's brought me, then I'm encouraged that he can finish what he started. Amen? Number 13. Does a person have any role to play in becoming righteous? Yes, we do. Matthew 7, 21. Jesus declared, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven. A lot of people in the last days will say, Lord, Lord. The Lord says, No, he that does the will of my Father. Can we do God's will without God's help? No. But through Christ, we can do all things. Amen? Amen? I beseech you, Romans chapter 12, this is a prayer that I want us to remember. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know why it's reasonable? God owns us because he created us. And if that's not enough, he then owns us because he bought us back. He redeemed us. Yes. By creation, by redemption, we are his property. Amen. Now, question number 14. What happened on the Day of Atonement? There was a special service. I want to talk for a second, then I'll get to the answer. Special service, once a year, at the end of the year, was a time when the people were cleansed from the sins that had been symbolically stored in the sanctuary. Now, one thing I want to establish. Are you aware that a goat and a lamb and a bull and a dove cannot take away a mortal's, a human's sin? Is that clear to everybody? You know the Bible writers recognize that as well. King David said, Thou desirest not sacrifice. The sacrifices of God are a contrite heart. If you read in the book of Micah, it says, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and rivers of oil? What does the Lord require? But to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. What the Lord wants is our hearts. It's only the blood of Jesus that can wash away sin. But you see, through the year, symbolically, the sins of the people, day after day, were stored in the sanctuary. God had a service where he was going to completely cleanse the people and the priests from the sins so there was no more sin in the land. You know, we're going to live in a universe where there's no more death, sorrow, sickness, disease, crying, pain, or sin. Will Jesus forever be bearing our sins? No, the Bible says he's coming without sin. He's returning without sin. So they had this service at the end of the year that would eradicate sin from everybody, including the priesthood and the temple. It was called the Day of Atonement. Now here's the answer, Leviticus 16.30. On that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins. And he was speaking to the people in particular. What happened on the Day of Atonement? You find most of this in Leviticus 16. They chose two goats that were to be spotless. One was called the Lord's goat. The other one was called what? The scapegoat. And you can find that in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8. Those two goats were vastly different, and some people get really confused on this issue. The Lord's goat represents the Lord. It dies, just as Christ died. Then after that, that goat was sacrificed, the priest then brings some of the blood into the Holy of Holies. He needed to have no sin in his life. As a matter of fact, you realize the priest's garments had little bells and pomegranates around the bottom. So when he was in the holy place and the Holy of Holies, they could hear a tinkling as he moved around and ministered. Jewish tradition tells us they tied a blue rope to his ankle. If the high priest had sin in his life when he went into the presence of God, he would be struck, struck dead. And if they didn't hear anything for a while, they would drag his corpse out. 
Of course, there's no record of this ever happening, but tradition tells us that they would do this. So the high priest needed to have his heart right. Ten days before the Day of Atonement, the Jews call that Yom Kippur today, they'd blow the trumpets. The people knew it was a time of judgment. They would put away their differences. They would humble themselves before the Lord. They'd wash their clothes. They'd consecrate themselves. Some of them would fast. And it was a time of self-examination, a time of judgment. You know there's a judgment that takes place before Jesus comes back? The last age of the church is called the age of Laodicea. You know what the word Laodicea means? A judging of the people. We're living in that time now. Christ, in Revelation, he starts out in the holy place, seven candlesticks. You get to Revelation 19 and you see the Ark of the Covenant. Christ, before he returns, you see the Ark. He is doing the work of our high priest now. He is cleansing the sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary. When he's done, Michael's going to stand up Judgment is over. The time of trouble will begin, and the Lord is going to come. We are on the verge of that event. After that blood was spread in the holy place, then they would take the scapegoat. They'd lay all the sins of all the people, and they'd put it on the scapegoat. They'd lead it by the hand of a trustworthy, a fit man, into the wilderness where it was to be abandoned, never to return. Now, that goat does not represent the Lord. Who dies for the sins of the devil? The devil does. You realize that Christ died for the sins of everybody here, but if you do not accept his forgiveness, you know what's going to happen? We will suffer for our works. I want to take the provision that he's provided, don't you? Amen. Otherwise, I suffer for my sins as well as Christ having already suffered for my sins. Wouldn't that be a terrible tragedy for him to waste his sacrifice on my behalf? But ultimately, the devil is going to bear the brunt for the great controversy. That's what the scapegoat represents. And when he is cast in the lake of fire and all the sinners are consumed, then sin is forever separated from God, from the priest, from the people, never to return again. And that was what was symbolized by this. And I realize you may have some questions. Write them in. I'll be happy to answer them for you. Number 15. Did the Day of Atonement foreshadow a cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary? Yes, this is where Jesus is now. He is our high priest, Hebrews 9, 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The heavenly sacrifice, what was offered there? Christ is offering his blood, not the blood of lambs. That sanctuary, that temple was activated when Jesus ascended into heaven. He went before the Father. He activated it. He has been serving as our high priest there. And you can now go to the Father through Christ. Isn't that good news, friends? Amen. You know, there's a story. One day a pastor was driving. Late one rainy night, like we have here in Manhattan right now, on a lonely road, cross country, and out in the middle of the headlights, he saw a man running back and forth across the highway. And the man was jumping up and down and writhing and falling down. It looked like he was in convulsions. And the pastor thought, oh boy, there's a maniac out here on the road in the middle of the night and, and I'm by myself and he, I'm not stopping. This guy's out of his mind. And the pastor thought, if I change lanes, I can get around him. So he started changing lanes. But instead, the man jumped into the lane where the pastor was going. And the pastor changed lanes again as he got closer and his windshield wipers are slapping and his headlights in the rain. He sees this maniac running around on the road having fits and falling down. And finally, the pastor thought, if I rev my engine, I'll change lanes at the last moment. I'll go around him because this guy's crazy. He's going to hurt me. Finally, as he approached the man, the man threw himself in front of the pastor's car when the pastor tried to change lanes. The pastor screeched on his brakes, stopped within inches of the man jumped out of his car in a rage to see if he had killed the individual and said, what's the matter with you? Are you crazy? I almost ran you over. There on the road, this individual began to sob. And he said, the bridge is out. The bridge is out. And I've watched as several cars and a busload of children drove off into the river and drowned, and I couldn't bear to see anyone else die. You know, the Lord is standing as an obstacle to your destruction, friends. Tonight, are you willing to say, Lord, I want to be totally yours, to be filled with your spirit, I want to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. I want that power and that desire to be like Christ. This is what the plan of salvation is like, that we might go through that heavenly transition where we can be conformed into His image. Is that your desire, friends? You at home, 
Would you like to be covered by the blood of the Lamb? That you can begin that journey by the altar, through baptism, by the labor, into the holy place, being part of God's people, and ultimately glorification in the promised land in the very presence of God. That's what the sanctuary is all about. How to get back into the Holy of Holies, where we can see him someday face to face. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the evidence of your presence here tonight. I've heard your voice speaking to my heart. I trust that you have spoken to those who are watching, those who are present here through the power of your word. We are so thankful for the blood of Jesus that saves us from sin in ourselves and sin in this wicked world. We are thankful for the promise that ultimately someday sin will be completely eradicated from the universe. There'll be no more devil, no more sinners, no more suffering, no more pain. Lord, I pray that the things we've learned from this sanctuary can be a reality in our lives. They can become substance. Bless these people. Help them to feel the power and purity that comes from Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Don't miss tomorrow night a very important study dealing with cleansing the temple. You'll receive a blessing and bring your friends.